And uh, those, I, those of you who don't know me, I'm Dr. Shustaf. I'm an oncologist, medical oncologist at Fred Hodgson Cancer Research Center. And I treat lymphomas for a living. And the area of my special interest are T cell lymphomas and skin lymphomas. And we are extremely lucky to uh, have recently recruited uh, Dr. Shinohara, who just uh, gave you a talk, and uh, she is an extremely bright new physician that has interest in this disease. And um, that kind of revolutionized our care of mycosis and skin lymphoma patients at um, Seattle Cancer Care Alliance because this disease really has to be approached from uh, multiple, um, uh, multiple uh, angles and uh, uh, with we, what we call uh, like to call multidisciplinary approach, and this avoids confusion and uh, necessity to talk to different specialists when we see patients in the same clinic on the same day. In fact, sometimes uh, when Michi sees patient and she comes out, I go see patient, she goes back, and we decide to we discuss it right away. We decide to do biopsy on the spot, or uh, we create treatments that. Uh, involves both a dermatologic perspective and oncologist perspective. I do my systemic therapies and she at the same time recommends skin care. And I cannot tell you how many times I was uh, um, really uh, belittled by my, um, not belittled, that's the wrong word, but um, put in place by uh, um, uh, Mitch's mentor, Dr. Olerud, when um, uh, I see patients with uh, skin lymphomas, and literally it's a rash, as you know, so, uh, some skin lesions, sometimes it's redder, sometimes it's more scaly, and I treat the patients and treatment doesn't work, and I'm frustrated, I said the drug has to work, it was working for the past couple of months, and all of a sudden it gets redder, and I called John, and I had, John, can you see this patient, because I'm, I'm about to change therapy. The patient goes to him and comes back two weeks later, boom, the rash is gone, it was skin infection. So I put patient on a biotic and all of a sudden the scaling is less, the redness is red, and I feel like a schmuck that, okay. Um, <laughs> but uh, then I realized that um, um, they, these guys have a uh, five-year special training to recognize, just look at the skin and say, ah, that's infection, don't worry about it. Oh, this is staph in the skin, or oh, this is just different type of rash. And sometimes, uh, actually most of the times, uh, patients with mycosis are not immune to any other skin disorders and I'm not trained to recognize this. Every time a new skin come, a new rash comes up, I always question is it mycosis progressing or is it just drug reaction that I gave patient last week and um, and that's where the expertise of the dermatologist is indispensable. That's why it's so important and so productive to have clinics that has both dermatologists and oncologists uh, to treat skin lymphomas. I uh, would like to uh, really thank Susan for doing such a phenomenal job with this foundation. I, um, I firsthand um, hear from patients uh, the difficulties and frustrations and, and challenges um, that are associated with cancer treatment and lymphoma treatment when patients uh, leave the physician's office. So my part is important, but it's probably a minor part of the entire cancer care. And then you guys go home and uh, your family members, you. Uh, um, the family members are uh, uh, very frightened and they want to help you and there is a burden of transportation, there's a burden of unknown, there's a burden of where do I read about this disease and, and that's where foundations like Cutaneous Lymphoma Foundation are really indispensable providing you with resources and education and support and bringing you together as a community that helps you to feel not alone with this disease because it is rare. If you live somewhere outside major academic centers in metropolis and you diagnose with mycosis, you go to oncologist and say, well, I've never seen this before. And you're like, holy cow, you know, how do you treat this you've never seen before? And um, do you have any patients like this? I've never seen the, or I haven't seen a patient like this for five years. And you feel like, gosh, I've, I have something that even my doctor doesn't know what it is. And not to mention that I don't even know if there are patients like me in the whole part of the country. So uh, when you come to the meetings like this, to uh, these forums, you kind of feel as a community. And uh, a lot of you, um, I know, are blogging or connecting online. And, and there are a whole community out there that um, you guys um, support each other. And I think it's just as important as what we do in, uh, in uh, clinical practice. For a long time, the relationship between oncologists and dermatologists wasn't very friendly because, as you can imagine, as a dermatologist, um, you focus on skin-directed care, uh, ointments and creams and radiation, and, um, and um, you don't see a lot of systemic side effects. And you also recognize that a lot of this 
rash-like mycosis lesions can be treated with topical injections, topical ointments, and um, frequently in the past when patients like uh, yourself with early stage disease, if you have early stage disease, refer to the oncologist and uh, in the past at least uh, oncologists, oh, this is lymphoma, I'm just going to give you a lot of treatments like we treat systemic lymphomas and it's going to go away. And um, first time I um, met Judy, uh, the former CEO of the Cutaneous Lymphoma Foundation, and I gave a talk at the patient forum and introduced the concept, say, well, CHOP is their own treatment. Uh, the second I finished my talk, Judy came up to me, hugged me, and said, okay, we're going on a rally, and we're going to fly all over the country. You have to tell the oncologists not to give CHOP to patients, because this was my fight for many, many, many years. And, um, and to um, uh, a large part, um, thanks to, to uh, Jody and, um, and um, sorry, Judy and, and the foundation, the, this education kind of spread out and oncologists started recognizing that skin lymphomas are very different from systemic type lymphomas and multi-agent chemotherapy is really a wrong thing to do because the treatments that we have for other lymphomas are very toxic and uh, they are not curative and in many cases provide only limited benefit for skin lymphomas. So what happens, patients go through three, four, five, six, sometimes I've seen patients go through eight cycles of CHOP type type treatment with three chemotherapy drugs, they lose their hair, they develop neuropathy and yeah, they respond very quickly but then two months later, boom, mycosis is back and what do you do now? After six months suffering all the side effects, it took a lot of education to um, um, convey this message to the oncologist that this multi-agent approach to skin lymphoma treatment is really probably not the best thing to do. Um, why is it so difficult to treat cancer in general and lymphomas without enduring side effects? Uh, one of the uh, Nobel Prize winners from Harvard University who uh, made revolutionary discovery in biology of cancer, actually in genetics of cancer, uh, has um, stated a very famous quote he uh, said that cancer is a distorted version of our cells. If you think about this very deeply, uh, cancer cells derive from our own body cells. They're not that different. In fact, they're almost the exact blueprint of your normal cell, of your muscle cell, or immune cell. Just something went wrong with it. Just one gene started malfunctioning and the cell forgot how to die. But if you look at the cell by those flow cytometry techniques that Michi was talking about, by histochemistry look exactly like normal cell and only maybe a couple of molecules are different. So it is very difficult to treat the cancer cell and not affect other uh, normal uh, body cells because basically the difference between the two is very, very small. And uh, another quote that I really like that I uh, read in a different book from one of the patients who went through a lot of cancer treatments um, and combination chemotherapy. Uh, he said that uh, treating cancer is like beating a dog with a stick try to get rid of the fleas. So you suffer all this beating and you suffer all the side effects to get rid of 0.01% of bad cells, but the whole body suffers. And um, unfortunately, we're still in an era, it's changing in oncology where we use these chemotherapy drugs that affect your bone marrow, that affect uh, nervous system with neuro affect your gastrointestinal system, there are long-term side effects, and try to get rid of a very small proportion of cancer cell. When I um, went to oncology and joined Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center, um, I um, uh, very early on kind of took the concept of, uh, uh, took a different approach to cancer treatment, at least the research, and tried to figure out how to treat cancer cells uh, in a very specific way. Uh, so that other normal cells are not affected. And this concept of targeted therapy or biologic therapy came very useful for um, skin lymphoma patients because you really want to attack what's wrong in the skin and kind of try to spare the, the normal cells. And we are still in the process, we're still in the infant stage of this philosophy, in the infant stage of this development, but uh, we are really making a lot of advances. And this started with another discovery by Nobel uh, Prize winner, um, uh, Brian Drucker from uh, OHSU, uh, Morgan State uh, uh, Health Science University, who uh, discovered a molecule to cure a subtype of leukemia. Uh, patients with this type of leukemia in the past we're all undergoing stem cell transplant with all the chemotherapies and high-dose treatment and total body radiation, graft versus host disease, and 
Brian went back to the lab from clinic for several years and uh, discovered a molecule just turns off the wrong gene. And just one flick cured all the patients with this leukemia. We don't transplant these patients anymore. And this opened the whole era of what we call targeted therapy. Try to find what gene is responsible or what target we can identify on tumor cells that is not present on normal human body cells and attack the cancer cells sparing the, the rest of them. And uh, over the past uh, five, six years, we've done a lot of research with collaborators in the country and several clinical trials, and that led to discover of several classes of drugs that are useful in cutaneous lymphomas and now approved to treat mycosis and um, other type of skin lymphomas that I will talk about. We have not found a drug yet that is a home run that produces 100% response rate to cure the disease, but this new advances really changed the way I treat patients in clinic. Five, six years ago, we only had chemotherapy, and it was a very frustrating time for uh, oncologists who treat mycosis because responses only seen in few patients. Uh, they're very short-lived, and they have drugs have side effects, and then lymphoma comes back, and you're stuck with trying to figure out what to do next. So this is changing and changing pretty um, pretty quickly in the last couple of years. So I will show you some of the interesting um, agents that we um, have uh, developed again in collaboration with other centers. Dr. Shinohara started talking about the class of drugs called histone deacetylase inhibitors uh, or HDAC inhibitors. And um, they have to do something with DNA folding. And Mitchie had a fantastic example of computer running all the time and uh, you have to um, really put a lot of genes to sleep. The concept of this uh, is even broader than this. Uh, and if you can imagine our human DNA, the interesting fact is that only 1% of all the genes is operable at any given time. 99% are, if you wish, like in a zip file, right? And if you turn on one of the genes that's responsible for uh, cells dying or cells stop making stimulation signals to other cells, this can have a huge impact on tumor growth because many tumor cells require constant stimulus, right? Either it's chemical stimulus or the stimulus that um, is transduced directly. So if you turn it off, the tumor cells might not have their survival signal. Or you can turn on the uh, signal that tells the tumor cells to die. So basically uh, what uh, we were trying to do is to, or scientists even before this went to clinic, is to unzip the files and find the gene that's responsible for tumor cells to go away or to die. And um, they figure out that the zip files are kept in check by several families of molecules, and one of them is acetylase. So what they, this, uh, these molecules do, they put the acetyl group on the DNA. As you can see on the left, there are those little sticks, they're acetyl groups. And um, these acetic um, acetyl groups, they're very charged. And when you put a lot of polarized, things on the, on the DNA, they just bounce off from each other. So basically you unfold the DNA. So on the right side of the slide you see the DNA that's unfolded and on the left side it's a tumor cell DNA that's all zipped. So when you unfold the DNA all of a sudden you open up the book and a lot of genes now are exposed to a special reading machine that starts reading the genetic code and activating the genes that are responsible for tumor cells dying. This is a very different concept from, uh, uh, from regular chemotherapy where you basically try to poison cells. You try to poison how they feed, you try to poison how they divide, and it affects regular normal cells in your uh, intestinal tract or your bone marrow. This is very different. You try to open up the book and tumor cells and read the right pages and give instructions to tumor cells to die off. And um, the concept of this is very broad, you can imagine. It's not just lymphomas that uh, follow the same track, uh, but other uh, cancers in terms of their development. So uh, this class of drug is now tested in breast cancer and had a neck cancer and lung cancer, but it really made the first advances in um, um, skin lymphomas and so-called systemic T cell lymphomas. So there are two drugs that are uh, available on the market uh, right now in the United States. One that Dr. Shinohara talked about is a pill called Varinostat or Zalinza and uh, patients take it every day uh, and over time again the 
tumor cell DNA unfolds and it leads to disappearance of the lesions in the skin. What I use as an oncologist in clinic because uh, it is a more, uh, it's an infusional drug and it requires a little bit more monitoring is the agent called remidapsin or Estadax. So remidapsin again belongs to a same family that I just described to you, HDAC inhibitors. It's a very potent drug and uh, it unfolds DNA very efficiently and when it was tested in skin lymphomas and uh, systemic T cell lymphomas, uh, approximately a third of the patients who failed a lot of prior therapies. A lot of patients had already stem cell transplant and tumor kept coming back. So a third of these patients responded and uh, some patients had complete remission, completely clearing of the skin and uh, for many, many months we didn't even see any lesions. A couple of challenges that we had with remidapsin is, um, are, uh, first it's a very long infusion. Uh, it's a four hour infusion, so by the time you come to oncology center, by the time the nurses check your blood counts, your blood pressure, they access your uh, intravenous device, um, it's six, eight hour day, depending how fast clinic runs, or how efficient it is, and the drug infused on a weekly basis. So every week you have one day basically that's taken away from your uh, home life. And um, the other thing that uh, a lot of patients experience, just like with the pill Dr. Shinohara described, is fatigue. Um, it is more prominent in folks who are in their 70s and 80s, and we can actually um, modify this by working with a dose, and sometimes we spread out the infusion of the drug instead of doing it on a weekly basis. We do it every two weeks, so we can work with the patient and um, with a schedule and dose, and many times increase the energy level and fatigue gets uh, better. But what every patient has, if you ask with this uh, uh, infusions, is something we call discosia or taste changes and it's very predictable. It happens a couple hours after infusion, it lasts for a couple of days. And um, I discovered in a very interesting way that uh, most likely it is not due to uh, damage to the taste buds like some other drugs do. Some chemotherapy drugs can actually damage the taste buds and people have metallic taste or have sour taste. Um, patients describe the changes in taste with remidapsin is just everything tastes bad, even water. You know, even water becomes kind of uh, uh, not very pleasant to drink and they stop eating for a couple of days and then everything goes back to normal. So what I again discovered by accident that it's most likely because remidepsin while it's in the body, it evaporates through the tongue, it kind of mixes with the food chemically and changes the taste. And the way I discovered that and I tell the story to all the investigators, one of my patients, um, his wife, um, her family owns a coffee plantation in, uh, in San Salvador and they go on vacation all the time and so they were trying to find time between the infusions uh, to go uh, at least for a week to visit the family and uh, say okay we're gonna skip this infusion you guys go and come back we'll resume the cycle so when the, this guy came back um, he told me that when they were on vacation there all his family was almost killed by mosquitoes there are so many mosquitoes they eat it and not a single mosquito touched him and he didn't have to use anything. For five days, he, like, he would literally walk in just trying to test the water. It's like, okay, where are you at? So come and get me. And there are mosquitoes everywhere that would come and just buzz off. Just like when you use deets and uh, they just taste it so apparent. And you know, mosquitoes have very keen sense of smell. And um, so my, I'm, I'm convinced that it's a uh, remidepsin that evaporates through the skin. It was very, very effective um, repellent. So I think that uh, uh, the similar thing happens uh, uh, with, uh, with the food taste. So um, overall, uh, when remidepsin got approved, it completely changed the landscape for oncologists to treat patients with mycosis. And I can uh, tell you, hands down, there is no other drug out there that when it works, uh, works so well. Uh, because patients that I had with very advanced disease, um, some of them uh, after developing response, stay in remission now for years. And the patient I just saw last week um, didn't want to continue with treatments. We usually continue therapy remidepsin indefinitely. We space out the infusion to from once a week to once a month. He didn't want to do it. Uh, one patient that I have who stopped treatment, uh, he is about 19, 20 months after stopping treatment, still in complete remission, not a single skin lesion. So there's something very unique about these drugs, and again, how they unfold the DNA and reprogram the tumor cells, 
that in some patient has a very, very stable response. So remidepsin became my number one drug I pulled from a shelf as an oncologist uh, to treat patients as close as possible to the frontline treatment. I don't want to even use chemotherapy anymore until uh, some of the drugs that I show you are, are failing treatment. And um, uh, the side effects I described to you is certainly much milder than other chemo drugs, real chemo drugs that we use to treat treat lymphomas. So very, very useful agent, and we now try to figure out how to combine this drug with other biologic agents uh, to really break away from chemotherapy completely because, again, we're realizing that skin lymphoma is a paradigm for biologic therapy. There is no hair loss. There is no neuropathy. There is no problems with liver tests. There is no problems with low counts. There is no significant problems with immunosuppression. So this is a kind of medicine that we want to really develop and, and practice in, in oncology in the uh, near future and try to discover more drugs like this and combine them and hopefully use less and less chemotherapy. And eventually, my hope is that even though I trained at Fred Hutchinson Center, you can imagine it's a very transplant-oriented program, um, I hope that in the next decade or so we're going to be transplanting less and less patients because we will be controlling disease much better without having to go through our sledgehammer approach with the bone marrow transplant. This is uh, one of the patients we treated on our international study with uh, extensive what we call patch black disease, uh, meaning the red spots and scaly red spots in the skin. and. This was a remarkable experience because you can see there it's one cycle of therapy. It's not six months of treatment, not four months of treatment. One cycle, three doses, and it was complete clearance of the skin with single agent, not four drugs like in CHOP, uh, not combining different regimens, but single biologic drug. Uh, very, um, and as you can see at the top, this patient received a lot of prior therapies. It's not just was diagnosed and treated, but a lot of prior treatments fail. This is a patient with what's called Cesare syndrome that Dr. Shinohara mentioned when the whole skin is red and scaly and very itchy, very uncomfortable. And in this case, four cycles, patient went from being red as a bee to completely normal skin. And um, I have um, a handful of patients, four off top of my head that had responses like this in Cesare syndrome and nothing. Cesare syndrome is a very difficult condition to treat. Uh, there are, again, a lot of symptoms and these patients have uh, a lot of itching, a lot of scale and feeling cold all the time. And it's very frustrating not to have a medicine that works. Uh, in addition, some of the drugs we use in the past can irritate skin even more because it's already irritated and sometimes tumor cells, quotes, get angry from chemotherapy, release more chemicals. And having something like this was really revolutionary to, to the oncologist to have something in my hands to help patients with, uh, with this syndrome and with this disease. Oops, I knew it's gonna happen. Um, I'm a, a PC person, this is Mac, and Mac just ate my graph. Um, <laughs> so what was on this slide uh, was the reduction in what we call pyritis score, or itching score. Uh, what was very interesting when we went, went back and kind of crunched our data, uh, we, uh, we have seen uh, a lot of reduction in itching, even in patients who did not have any change in their skin appearance. And um, most of the patients who have response whose skin lesions shrink, like I showed you, obviously itching goes away. But there were 60% of patients in whom skin did not change that stopped itching on the dot when start using remidepsin. And we don't have a good explanation for that, but hypothesis is that that unzipped files that I talked about, it just probably turned on or turned off the genes responsible for chemicals produced by tumor cells. It did not activate the genes that make the tumor go away, but at least it shut off the production of itchy chemical. And, um, and for many patients, it's a, uh, especially with Cesare syndrome, it's the most kind of bothersome, most desirable first effect at least to stop itching because people cannot sleep and they scratch all the time and they're, you know, when they're uh, trying to sleep, they wake up at night and they're fatigued all the time because of the um, insomnia, etc. So what was here is the dramatic reduction in, uh, in itching score when using this class of drugs was uh, very uh, significant for patients. 
Another agent that we um, develop, again, nationally, uh, collaborating with other centers uh, is prolatrexate or folatin. And uh, prolatrexate is a big brother of the drug that we used for a long time uh, in mycosis called methotrexate. Uh, also the drug that used very extensively in medicine to treat other skin disorders like psoriasis and autoimmune conditions like rheumatoid arthritis and lupus, very broadly used agent. So um, when methotrexate treatment fails, we usually abandon this type of treatment and go to the next agent. So our research is at uh, Stanford and um, Southern Technology Institute about seven years ago, uh, went back to the lab and decided, okay, why does methotrexate fail? Can we develop something that is much stronger? So they twisted the molecules different ways, and um, at the end of the experimentation, they found the analog of methotrexate that has 15 times more potency. It incorporates into the tumor cells faster, and actually um, via a certain mechanism gets trapped inside the tumor cells and kills them. So here's the cartoon of how prolatrexate works, and the blue ribbon at the top is a membrane, cell membrane. Uh, all cells have this lipid membrane, and chemicals, including chemotherapy or other drugs, don't just get into the cell randomly. They have to have a what we call transporter, and this protects our cells from toxin that we expose to or other chemicals. So they, they're very selective, in, including tumor cells, what they can engulf and transport into the tumor cells. And um, there is this molecule called RFC1, or reduced folate carrier, that is present only when we develop in utero as babies, as, fe uh, um, as fetuses, and it's also present activate on tumor cells. And that's how methotrexate gets into the cell. It gets attached to the pump and pumped into the cell. So the, this research, as I was uh, talking about, they twisted the molecule such that the, the bond between the RFC1 and prolatrexate is 15 times higher than methotrexate and RFC1. So the drug very readily gets inside the cells much faster than methotrexate. But what happens, they didn't realize, they discovered it later, that while methotrexate is pumped out immediately, so it's a two-way pump, it just pumps it in, pumps it out. So when prolatrexate gets inside the cell, they found the enzyme there that puts a lot of different acid on top of it, it's called glutamic acid, it gets polyglutamated, so it's covered with glutamic acid. And remember, we talked about charged molecules, it makes, makes prolatrexate very charged. It, it gains the negative charge, and now remember, membranes are neutral, right? That's why lipid never mixes with water. Now being so charged, it just cannot exit the cell, it gets trapped called intracellular trapping. So uh, it's almost like it sucks it in much faster, but then once it's in, it cannot exit. And then it works the same way as methotrexate uh, to uh, spare you a lot of chemistry. It blocks folic acid, right? We need folic acid to build new cells. It blocks the folic acid. The tumor cells cannot build the DNA, and they die. So that's the mechanism by which prolatrexate works. And by and large, it's just 15 times more potent than uh, methotrexate. So going back to this, um, just like methotrexate, it belongs to the class of drugs called antifolates that block folic acid. And when we tested this, again, in different types of lymphoma, it turned out that skin T cell lymphomas and systemic T cell lymphomas were most sensitive to deprivation of folic acid. And we did study in both systemic lymphomas and skin lymphomas, and it turned out that almost half the patients with skin lymphomas responded very briskly to prolatrexate while they were resistant to methotrexate. And drug became approved in 2009 to treat systemic T cell lymphoma, and after we finished the study and published it in skin lymphomas, it was also added to national guidelines to treat mycosis fungoides. And this became my second line drug to treat patients. When remidepsin fails, or if it doesn't work, uh, this is another agent that I use very frequently as a single drug. Again, not combining different chemotherapy drugs. as a single drug to treat mycosis, and it's very, very useful in patients who have skin tumors, and it's very useful with patch plaque disease, again, with those patches on the skin. It is not as effective for Cesarus syndrome for some reason. So Cesarus syndrome is more sensitive to the first drug. This is more uh, useful for tumor stage uh, for cutaneous skin tumors and, uh, and patches and plaques. Good news about prolatrexate, it's a very fast infusion. So when patients that three in my clinic first received 
remidapsin, it's uh, then a breeze to get treated with prolotrexate because infusion is only two minutes. When they're used to four hours sitting in the chair, this is they, they barely sit in the chair, two minutes, boom, you're done. And uh, the treatment's still done on a weekly basis. And the useful thing about prolotrexate, it has a very, what we call, broad therapeutic range. So we tested it as a very high dose with systemic lymphomas and low dose with skin lymphomas. And it works at low dose. And if it doesn't work at low dose, we know the safety, you just keep escalating the dose. And you can quadruple it safely if you um, see that effect goes up with, um, with increasing the dose. Biggest problem or biggest challenge or something to be aware of with, with prolotraxate, just like methotraxate, some patient can develop uh, sore throat and uh, mouth sores. They're temporary, they last three, four, five days, uh, but um, some patients will, um, again, have this mouth pain and, and won't be able to eat for a couple of days. There is an antidote uh, that we can um, use to prevent future development of this. Uh, it's called Lucavorin. If people have very severe uh, problems with uh, mouth pain and not being able to eat, then we can overcome this effect, still use the drug, and use antidote um, and uh, potentially patients will stay on treatment. The toxicity otherwise is very mild compared to say CHOP treatments or other chemotherapy. Some folks will have um, drop in the platelet count by about 40, 50%, but not even close to what chemotherapy causes. I never had to transfuse anybody when I treat uh, skin lymphoma with prolotraxate. Nausea, uh, very mild. I've never seen vomiting with prolotraxate. And, um, um, again, the convenience is compared to remidepsin, it's a very fast infusion, and it's a single drug. There is no hair loss, uh, there is really no significant uh, effect on the bone marrow, we don't see any toxicity to the lung, to the heart, or other organs, like many chemotherapy drugs do. So again, this became my second line treatment for um, skin lymphoma. So we are really breaking away uh, from the systemic combination treatments for majority of patients with just skin disease and uh, getting more and more smarter drugs that specifically attack tumor cells, sparing um, other organs. And this is my first patient uh, that I treated with this drug on the trial at the time. Um, and uh, this was a patient with uh, Cesare syndrome. Uh, the, sometimes the picture doesn't really reflect the real um, 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 symptoms and uh, the presentation when you look at the patient, but. Uh, this was a gentleman with very leathery skin. The skin was very thick, very inflamed, uh, very itchy. And um, uh, you see like on the left side, those are uh, when patients obviously itch, they, the skin becomes very rough and scaly. And um, it was a very scary experience. Uh, when I gave this guy the first dose of prolotrexate, he came to clinic two days later and doc, my skin is on fire. And um, this looks very similar to um, in medicine, we call Steven Johnson syndrome, when it's basically death of the skin or skin necrosis. And people can have that outside mycosis is just re really bad reaction to certain drugs. Any drug can cause uh, such a dramatic side effect. But he comes to clinic, and I look at it and say, oh my god, what's going on? And I call Dr. Olerud, and I say, hey, I need you to drop everything. I'm getting this guy to you. We uh, had this reaction to skin. I think it's uh, Steven Johnson syndrome. and. So John sees this guy, he grabs the biopsies, and we try to convince him to go to burn unit because uh, the same thing happens on his arms and legs and his back, so he lost 20, 30% of his skin surface. Obviously, this is gate for infection. And, um, but the guy, guy refused to go, he went home, and biopsy comes back a couple days later, and this is all dead tumor. This is not reaction, this is not reactive or adverse reaction. Uh, drug killed the tumor cells so quickly that the tumor just died on the skin and all this um, open areas. He comes back several days later, all these things are healing. So the new skin comes back and he developed, again, his whole tumor cleared and um, his skin looked normal for quite a while after treatment. This is still early in his healing, but you can appreciate that uh, all these areas are healing up within several days. So this was a, again, a very, um, interesting experience with prolotraxate. Uh, we called it um, uh, 
subcutaneous uh, tumor lysis syndrome or skin tumor lysis syndrome. We have this concept in oncology. If a drug is very active, it can kill tumor cells so uh, very quickly. It can be very hard on the body, and then kidney gets overwhelmed with all the junk, the tumor cell release, etc. And we um, uh, I thought that the same thing is happening in the skin. It's just killed so quickly that uh, the uh, patient develop all these ulcerations. Finally, I will uh, talk about another super exciting new drug. Uh, just like Romidepsin, when I mentioned that it really changed how we think about uh, treating cancer and uh, revolutionized uh, treatment of um, skin lymphomas, this is more recent um, development, and um, this uh, agent, the Brintoximab Vidotin, and now it's called Etcetris, made a lot of noise in oncology in general. One of the ways to target tumor cells is to either identify those molecules that are abnormal in tumor cells and do, are not present on normal cells. If you target them, you can potentially spare your body from toxicity of chemotherapy. And one of the ways to do that is to use our immune system, right, or learn something, use the concept that immune system uh, employs to fight the infection. So for the past 30, 40 years, due to a lot of research, um, what the class of drugs that we use in oncology and other areas of medicine called antibodies. So when we, ha when we have flu, pneumonia, um, other infections, the way our immune system fights it is by producing these molecules called antibodies. And antibodies uh, look like this forks. Um, and uh, on the tip of the fork is a very special recognition site, if you wish. It's so specific that it only targets one molecule, a part of a molecule, and nothing else. And that's how we fight bacteria as well. We develop these antibodies, can recognize only certain molecules on bacteria and nothing else. So in a way, it's a targeted missile. So it recognizes only what it's supposed to. So scientists took this concept and developed this antibody outside human body and targeted them to disease determinants or disease molecules. And obviously, we, in oncology, we started um, applying this concept, studying this concept, because we want to target the tumor cells and nothing else. And several years ago, actually more than a decade ago now, when I uh, just entered the oncology, uh, the first drug like this was approved called Rituxin or Rituximab, and it's antibody against the molecule called CD20. And we use it now for every patient with B-cell lymphomas. And because it's an antibody, it's not chemo. It's an immune molecule like we all have. It virtually has no side effects. Uh, the only side effect that you can expect from this is the um, infusion reaction, just like when you vaccinate for a person. Sometimes you can have fever for a couple of days. It's a large molecule, so your body kind of like, whoa, what is that? And uh, reacts to it, and people can have rash, flushing, itching, sometimes palpitations with infusions, but with pre-medication, like with Benadryl, uh, with steroids a little bit, uh, all these reactions go away. Besides that, there is no bone marrow suppression, there is no effect on any organ systems because it's such a targeted agent. In the past three, four years, we worked with our local pharmaceutical company called Seattle Genetics. And Seattle Genetics developed a very interesting technology that, again, revolutionized how we treat cancers. So they took the antibody. In this case, uh, it is targeting molecule called CD30. And uh, they purified it. Right, so it's just the targeted missile. But then say, okay, if antibody itself doesn't kill the tumor cells, we're gonna put something on it. So they put a warhead on the antibody, on this missile. And this warhead, as you see, this, this spiky thing, it's a toxin called MMAE, right? And, they, and what, what was new in their discovery, they used a special linker right here. And um, that linker is very stable uh, when it, present in human plasma. So when you infuse this antibody in somebody's blood, uh, this bond there is never broken because this linker is very stable. And even molecules that usually destroy these linkers cannot work on this, right? So once the missile finds the target, and it finds every single target because of how immune system works, if you imagine this is a tumor cell, and those red things on the top of it are CD30, right? So this missile finds the CD30 and attaches to it. And what usually tumor cells do, just like normal cells, is something attaches to the surface. Our cells um, act as jellyfish. It just sucks it in and puts it in the bubble and digests it. That's how our cells fight the intruders. So 
in a way it becomes a Trojan horse, right? So the tumor cell sucks it in and try to destroy whatever hit it. By destroying it, it breaks the linker because there's special enzyme inside the tumor cells. And now the toxin is released inside the tumor cells and it just cannot survive. It completely breaks this netting inside the tumor cells that necessary for survival. So it became a targeted missile that has warhead that specifically targets the tumor cell. And again, in this case, it's CD30. So when we tested this in systemic lymphomas that have the target, and that's why it was so revolutionary when we presented this in Europe and it was, it was one of the biggest news, 90% of patients with incurable lymphomas responded just this drug alone that failed transplant, failed combination chemotherapies. Some of them had six, seven lines of treatments. Single drug alone uh, put 60% of patients in complete remission. So tumor just melted away, okay? And several uh, or a significant proportion of patients stayed in remission up until this date. So our survival curves actually plateaued. A lot of patients never relapsed being treated with this drug. Now, as you can imagine, what's the limitation of this? We have to have a target, right? If the tumor cell doesn't have a target, you cannot use this drug. You have to develop another drug for the target. So that's why this technology is still being developed. Now this company has six or seven different antibodies with the same linker, the same toxin targeting different, uh, different cancers. But this was a big win for subtype of systemic T cell lymphoma. Now the interesting part is that a lot of mycosis cells have CD30. 30-40% um, of MF uh, could express certain levels of CD30. Now, the important part is mycosis can sometimes kind of explode, can transform, and become very aggressive. Instead of just being patches and plaques, uh, it can become aggressive lymphoma. And when this happens, more than half the patients have that target, their tumor has that target. So this became a very useful agent to try in mycosis. And very recently, there are a couple of studies that um, Dr. Young Kim reported that um, uh, Michi mentioned in Stanford uh, in patients with mycosis and Dr. Duvik at MD Anderson Center. So they treated patients with mycosis who had the target. And uh, more than half the 60% of patients had a response, resolution of the tumors. Now, the most remarkable part of it is uh, what she presented a couple of, actually about a year ago, that the drug worked even in tumors that do not have the target. They couldn't find CD30 in their surface and it still worked. So they went back to the lab and said, what's going on here? It's a targeted drug. It's supposed to kill the tumor cells that have the target, and this patient never had CD30. So, and they had to use the, um, the help of some basic chemists, some, some uh, scientists at Stanford that develop a special technology to look for traces of CD40 on the tumor cells. Because the way we test it is this flow cytometry technique, immunochemistry technique, but it can see um, the minimum of 50,000 molecules per cell, something about that. So if the tumor cell has only 1,000 molecules, our methods won't detect it. So we're going to be missing a lot of patients whose tumor has the target and never give them the drug. So they went back and developed this almost like x-ray technology to look at the cells, and they found out that by conventional techniques that cells don't have the target, actually do have the target. It's just much lower than we can detect. And it was just enough so this antibodies can attach to it and kill the tumor. So even negative tumors became target for, um, for this drug. And what we actually have open now for different type of lymphoma, we treat patients with CD30 negative tumors with this drug, try to figure out how many of them will respond. Another patient of mine, that the first patient that I treated with this drug on a study, uh, it's not mycosis. There is this aggressive skin lymphoma called anaplastic large cell lymphoma. It's kind of a aggressive brother of MF or mycosis fungoides, and usually people have rapidly progressive tumors. Most of the patients will have one or two tumors that if you radiate, they go away and patient can stay in remission for years. They come back again and radiate. This particular patient had a very refractory disease. He had 67 tumors on his leg. And was irradiated, had chemotherapy, and keep progressing and progressing and progressing. So these are just some of the pictures. This was pre-treatment. You see this ulcerated, um, like donut-like tumor. One dose, it completely flattened out. This spot here, we took a biopsy right away. 
and this was second dose, the tumor started healing, another biopsy, one dose of the drug annihilated the tumor. We couldn't find it after just one infusion of, of this brintuximab pedotin. So tumor, first dose, second dose. Some other sites, another two kind of twin tumors, one dose um, with uh, the suture there is a biopsy, and then second dose completely gone away. The pussy material is a dead tumor. We biopsied both at uh, both time points, and there was no tumor left. Finally, another uh, site of the disease, twin tumors, one dose, resolution. So this new drug, brintuximab, etc., et cetera, became a very potent uh, tool that we now use in uh, systemic T cell lymphomas and more and more extensively now in, in cutaneous lymphomas. Another example of targeted uh, treatment and how we use natural toxins and target them to the tumor. There is this uh, drug called Ontac, or it has a long name, Dinalukin Diftitox. Um, and I've used it probably a couple dozen times in my clinic. It's an infusional agent again. In this case, the scientists who developed that took the most potent toxin that nature ever designed. You guys know that we use it in bioterrorism, right? So it's a botulin, botulism toxin. And uh, so they took the genetic material for that and fused it to another gene that we have for a molecule called interleukin-2. So when they're fused together, this toxin cannot work because the active, the, the weapon that the toxin has is not exposed. And uh, it only can work if you cleave that bondage there. So they created this drug. And uh, IL-2 or interleukin-2 uh, serves as a missile, as in the first case, but it's not an antibody. It's such a natural molecule that our body makes. And a lot of mycosis cells, a lot of tumors like mycosis have a receptor or kind of receptacle for that IL-2. So we infuse this drug, again, intravenously. This toxin is not dangerous because when it's fused, it doesn't work. So then the IL-2 finds the tumor cell, attaches to it, the same thing. Tumor cell sucks it in, the bondage is broken, and now inside the tumor cells, you have botulism toxin that obviously tumor cells cannot survive. And the drug was tested and approved about six, seven years, actually, maybe even longer than that. Um, so this was available for a while. But just to give you the idea as an example, where we're moving from chemotherapy to targeted treatments, and that's something also I've used quite a bit, uh, more so uh, before other drugs came about uh, for my patients with mycosis. The IL-2 interleukin-2 is a very active molecule, and that's something our body makes when we have flu, when we have infections. So these infusions are associated with flu-like symptoms, with fevers, sometimes uh, low blood pressure. And sometimes patients can be overwhelmed with this IL-2 molecule and develop uh, bigger problems. That's why the drug is, is targeted, but it can have quite a few side effects, and uh, people can accumulate fluid, and fluid sometimes can be in the stomach or in the chest, so the drug is out there, and if you run out of options, I used it, and I uh, used it quite a bit uh, in the past, but now that we have three first options that I showed you, kind of move to the fourth and fifth line in my practice. But certainly, again, it's a targeted agent that spares other cells in your body that chemotherapy don't. I'm not going to talk much about this. Dr. Shinohara touched on it, and um, total skin therapy, uh, radiation therapy, entire skin uh, is very useful. For us. Um, I will just mention briefly, when everything else fails, you have to use chemotherapy. Uh, we're still developing newer and newer drugs for uh, skin lymphomas, but uh, luckily now we have remidepsin, prolotrexate, ONTAC, et cetera, is the one I showed you, but at some point in time, um, if tumor cells find a way to resist those and keep growing back, we have to default back. Again, we really moved, especially in the academic centers for so physicians who treat a lot of this uh, lymphoma, moved away from combination treatments. And um, two drugs that I think most useful as far as chemotherapy goes for mycosis are gemcitabine, and the other one is called doxyl, apigulated doxorubicin. Uh, they produce pretty high responses, and a lot of patients would stay four, six, 12 months uh, with disease control. The problem with chemotherapy drugs, you cannot use them indefinitely, because these are real chemo drugs, and they have cumulative side effects. Gemcitabine, after six months of therapy, can really uh, take a toll on the bone marrow. And uh, doxyl we cannot use uh, indefinitely because it can affect the heart muscle. 
but for four, six months, especially if we are trying to prepare patients for the next step, say the bone marrow transplant, uh, or control their uh, disease before um, insurance approves, say, other drugs, uh, these are useful agents that uh, sometimes come handy. Finally, I will mention our sledgehammer, and I gave you my disclaimer. My life goal is to send less and less patients to transplant, even though I trained and I, I attended on the transplant service for quite a bit. Um, this is really drastic approach. Um, when I talk to patients uh, in my clinic, I do consults regarding transplant. Um, I call it a trade-off. It's not really a... Um, it is a curative approach uh, or curative intent uh, approach to a patient's disease, but it's a trade-off. You basically, what you're trying to do, you trade the fatal disease to livable disease. And a uh, majority of patients uh, will um, suffer a consequence of transplant for the rest of their life. And needless to say that we use it only when everything else fails and we don't have any other options or we sense from the very beginning the disease is very aggressive and even though we didn't start treatment yet, we can predict that there is 90% chance the treatment is going to fail, and uh, we talk about transplant up front. The idea of allogeneic transplant is that you receive somebody else's immune system. So the bone marrow makes our blood cells, our immune cells, so when you transplant somebody's bone marrow, you also pass the immune system from the donor to the recipient. And what happens there the donor's immune system wakes up in the, in the patient's body and says, who is this? And starts attacking it, right? Because that's how immune system works. And um, our tumor cells, as I mentioned to you at the very beginning, are not that different from our own cells. So it's a, it attacks the tumor cells, but the other side of the coin is it affects other organs. It attacks, it can attack the liver, can attack the skin, can attack the mouth cavity, can attack any organ. It's called graft versus host disease. So the first effect of graft versus leukemia, the second graft versus host. And we haven't figured out the way yet to separate, separate the two. So if you have graft versus leukemia, you'll have graft versus host. And the trick of the transplant, the art of the transplant is really to keep the graft versus host disease at a very manageable level because you want a little bit of GVHD. Because if you don't have it, we know that the tumor have higher chance of escaping. So the trick is to keep graft versus host disease as a livable, and uh, very mild disease, but this response or this attack is enough to control the tumor. It's the same principle that we use to treat leukemias, lymphomas, or whatever we use transplant for, including mycosis. So this is kind of ax in the hole approach. Um, we only use it in desperate situations when other treatments fail, and it requires that patients have very good control of their disease prior to going to transplant. And that's where we start using combination chemotherapies. That's the only situation where I can justify giving somebody, not even just CHOP, but even stronger combinations to suppress the tumor. So when a new immune system comes in, it works with a very small amount of disease, like an infection, to wipe it out. Because if a person has a lot of tumor left and his immune system is just overwhelmed by how much it needs to kill and transplant fails. Recently, um, at our institution, um, there was a discovery that was um, made or development, um, again, 10 years ago, it's, uh, 10, 12 years ago, started so-called mini transplants. Um, Dr. Ryan Storp at uh, Fred Hodgson Center was a pioneer of this. And uh, this is a way, kind of slick way of doing transplant where patient does not receive massive amounts of chemotherapy to prepare for transplant. Uh, the bone marrow is transplanted uh, without any preparation, so to speak, or very mild preparation, and the person becomes a chimera for a while. So you have your own bone marrow, and you have donor's bone marrow, and they kind of coexist for a while. But then over a period of several months, the transplanted bone marrow, transplant immune system, kills off the recipient bone marrow and takes its place. That's why it's called a mini transplant. Otherwise, you just have to wipe out the bone marrow before the transplant. So there is a very slick way of doing it, and the biggest advantage of that is that now we can do this transplant for older patients and patients with different conditions that cannot tolerate high-dose treatments. So the oldest patient that I sent to transplant was 74, and he actually did really well, and we cured his systemic lymphoma. So in the past, the cutoff was 60 years of age and 
anything older than that, we couldn't do transplant. Now we can do this in, uh, way into mid 70s and potentially late 70s. So um, I think this is the last thing I wanted to mention as far as uh, oncologic approach to lymphoma. And um, Dr. Shannon talked about this. And finally, I would like to finish with new development. So the drugs that I showed you already approved. We studied them, we continue to study them, and they are, uh, we have them as our tools. Uh, the new study that we have uh, is very, very exciting. I think it might be another uh, big victory in uh, lymphomas in general, and mycosis in particular. Uh, Japanese company developed another antibody. And we talked about antibodies that targeted missiles. And this is a naked antibody, nothing attached to it. So it's called, it has this convoluted name, Magamolizumab. It took me a couple of months to learn how to pronounce it. But um, uh, this antibody targets, again, the molecule on surface of lymphoma cell called CCR4, or chemokine receptor type 4. And it works not by delivering the toxin to the tumor cells, but just the natural way immune system works. Once the tumor cell is coded by the antibody, your other immune cells see it as a target and attack the tumor. So what's shown there on the top is called complement, and it's part of your immune system. And complement doesn't kill just any target, but only the target that's coded by antibody. So if you infuse the antibody, and antibody finds the tumor cells, it activates the complement at the top, and this complement punches holes in the tumor cells, and they just explode. And there are other effector cells that see the tumor cells coated with antibody. It's a target for them. They work like jellyfish. They just kind of like engulf it and digest it. So we have a study at our institution uh, that is open uh, with this antibody. It's still experimental in the United States. It's approved in Japan to treat T cell lymphomas. And we are doing a study nationally uh, for patients with mycosis uh, fungoides that failed other treatments or prior treatments. It's very exciting new technology, and uh, we are, with Magamalizumab, we are in the experimental phase of it. But I think uh, seeing activity that we've seen in Japan, and we've seen so far in the study, it will be another new drug that uh, hopefully will be approved in the next couple of years. And uh, I will finish with um, the notion that I would strongly encourage, I always encourage patients to consider participation in clinical trials. And I'm a strong believer that, first of all, that's how we uh, create new treatments, but also that's how we make people live longer and cure more patients. In the United States, 90% of children are treated by academic centers just because children, uh, pediatric oncology is so complex and there are not many pediatric oncologists out there, so 90%. Out of this 90%, three quarters go into clinical trials. In adult oncology, only 7% of patients are treated in academic centers. Out of those seven, only 15% go into clinical trials. As one example, I can give you up to a dozen examples. There is this leukemia called acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Pediatricians cure 90% of kids. We only cure 20% of adults. The reason that pediatricians cure 90% of the kids, because 90% of kids go on clinical trials and go to academic centers. So if you're on the cutting edge of this technology uh, and there is no effective therapy in a the community, there is, absolutely, there is no doubt in my mind that by participation in clinical trials, not only benefits the science and development of new drugs, but it benefits the patients trying new agents years before they get approved. And again, that's how pediatricians makes their tremendous improvements over the past 40 years. St. Jude's Hospital, our hospital, and Harvard University, those centers that, uh, that kids flock to uh, to treat diseases that are otherwise incurable. And um, there is a big gap between how many kids being cured and how many adults being cured in this country. And one of the biggest factors, again, in healthcare delivery, 90% of adults treat in the community, 90% of kids treat academic centers on the clinical trials. So there are risks of being a clinical trial. We don't know whether this magalmalizumab will be effective. So you might commit to the clinical trial and not all of them are as successful. So you might go through all the treatments and three years later, the analysis show there is no benefit. And um, at the same time, um, it introduces another option that otherwise is not available with fair chance of 
this being a very effective drug because before, until, uh, before these drugs go into human trials, they go very ex uh, through very extensive testing. In animals, they go to phase one studies, they go phase two studies, and uh, by the time they get to the point of approval trials, there is a very good chance these drugs would be effective but it introduces another option that you can use that otherwise is not available in a community. And again, um, comparing adult oncology, pediatric oncology, there is a very strong chance that why pediatricians cure more children than we cure adults. So always consider uh, or ask your physicians about what clinical trials are available or uh, on um, Cutaneous Foundation uh, site or uh, NIH uh, websites, you can check what trials are open around the country and it's worth sometimes exploring outside just one practice. And if you have relatives, say, in Chicago, and Chicago tr trial is open, it's always worth at least considering uh, new treatments for your disease. So I'll finish there and take questions.